Well, if you've been with us, we've been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous uh, sermon that he gave, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And today we finally approach Matthew 7. And so the title of today's message, actually, that we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And so the title of today's message is called Judging Others, Judging Yourself. And so Jesus continues on in his sermon. We're going to start at verse 1 and verse uh, chapter 7. And this is what he says here. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, you will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we go into God's word together. Lord Jesus, we want to just thank you for our time here as a church. Uh, We thank you even for the worship this morning, just reminding us of the God that you are. Uh, We pray that as we approach your word, that you would help us to see this text with clarity, uh, such a very important text. And so God, we ask that you would open our hearts and just really illuminate our spiritual eyes, that we would uh, really see what you want to say to us this morning. And so God, as always, we depend on you. We depend on the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Well, when I first moved to the area, I wanted to get in shape. And so I was looking for different gyms in the area. And so after visiting a lot of gyms, I visited a Planet Fitness right down the street. And as I was going to Planet Fitness, I saw this one sign that really caught my eye. And it said, home of the judgment-free zone. I'm not sure if you heard of this. And it was very catchy. And I was thinking about this slogan, and I went on the website to really understand what this slogan meant. And I read this little excerpt from the CEO, Chris Rondo, from the co-founder of Planet Fitness. And this is what he said here. We believe the first step in creating a judgment-free zone is to remove the things that make people feel judged or intimidated. We wanted to cater to this population, so Planet Fitness became known as the Judgment-Free Zone, a welcoming and friendly community where people could feel comfortable regardless of their fitness level. At Planet Fitness, being judgment-free is core to what we stand for as a brand, and we have seen firsthand the great things that people can accomplish when they feel welcome and accepted. Don't we love that? We can go to a place where we are not judged by our body type or fitness level. And in today's text, Jesus is also going to communicate to us the same thing. Judge not that you be not judged. It is probably the most quoted, but I would also say the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. People who are not even Christians quote this verse. I'm not sure if you've ever heard someone say, maybe you've heard, or maybe you said it yourself, don't judge me. And when we say that, we are quoting Jesus. And so this teaching can be a little bit confusing, but in order for us to follow the call of Jesus, we need to understand what Jesus is actually communicating here. And so the question we want to look at this morning is what is Jesus commanding us to do when he says, do not judge? What is Jesus commanding us to do when he tells us, do not judge? And so we're going to look at three parts. We're going to walk through this passage. And first, we want to look at the proper perspective of judging and the attitude that we need to have when it comes to judging and the discernment we need when it comes to judging. So in verse one, I'm going to read this again. Judge not that you be not judged for the judgment you have pronounced will be, uh, you pronounce, uh, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it uh, will be measured to you. Now, a couple of things I want to point out here as we look into this text. What this passage does not mean is a couple of things. It does not mean that that it is an escape from any kind of moral accountability. 
I think oftentimes when we look at this verse, we relate it to some kind of moral accountability. We look at what people do in their life and we say, do not judge me. That is a misapplication of this teaching. If you actually look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is actually giving right and wrong, how we should view marriage, how we should view adultery and lust. So it's not a a verse to escape moral culpability. The second thing we want to understand that what this passage does not mean, it does not mean we never correct people or that we deflect any faults of another person that another person has for us. And so it also does not mean that we don't allow people to speak into our lives or also that we speak into each other's lives. How do we grow and mature as a body of Christ? We need to speak the truth in love. And so what this passage does not mean is that we should never accept criticism or we should never speak out on certain things that we see in a brother or sister. And so what does this passage actually mean? Well, I think definitions is going to help us to understand what this means. When you think about to judge, to judge, the definition of to judge is to evaluate, to make an assessment or conclusion about someone's behavior and actions. It's a fair and honest assessment of the situation. When you think about what it means to be judgmental, The definition is pointing out sins in others out of self-righteousness without offering mercy and helping to restore them. It's a heightened awareness of another person's faults or simply being overcritical. And that's what Jesus is getting at when he says, do not judge. He's warning us against judgmentalism and condemnation. It's when we point out the weaknesses and the failures of other people. And the truth is, often we are not very good at making objective assessments of what is right or wrong. Because the truth is, we, because we are flawed, we attach a certain spirit to it. We often think that we are better or that we know more. And what that leads to is a very condemning spirit when we speak into other people's lives. I think in summary, what Jesus is getting at is don't be hypercritical. Don't be hypercritical. Again, it doesn't mean that we don't make judgments, but also means that we don't always give criticism. Again, we should discern what is right and wrong. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, hate what is evil, love what is good. He's giving us this judgment that we should discern what is right and what is wrong. And so being to say do not judge, it means does not mean that we should never analyze, but we should have a discerning spirit of what is right and wrong and not a condemning spirit. You see, with the condemning spirit, we dismiss a person. And that's what Jesus is getting at when he gives us this command. For example, let's say someone has lied to you, right? And what happens oftentimes when someone lies to us, we get very angry. And we have a right to be angry. Maybe we feel betrayed. Maybe we feel like we have a right to call that person out. Or we set up boundaries in that relationship. And sometimes That's very healthy in a relationship. Someone lies to you. But to look at that person and always look at them as a liar is a condemning spirit. What it often leads to is things like criticism or you gossip behind their back or you slander them or even worse, you hate them or you wish terrible things upon them. Now, at this point, it leads to condemnation. You're diminishing that person. You are taking the place of God and making final judgment on that person. And that's what Jesus is telling us when he says, do not judge. You see, the reason why he tells us this is because it leads us to this place of of condemnation, but also self-righteousness thinking that we are better than we actually are or thinking that we know more than another person. And Jesus says that in our community, yes, we need to discern when it comes to other people and our relationships, but don't be hypercritical. 
And so when it comes to being this idea of do not judge, we also need to understand that judgmentalism flows from the notion that we are the highest standard. So when Jesus says, do not judge, what it really means is that we think that we are the highest standard and we have a right to judge other people. You see, having an understanding that God is judge transforms our view of others. I think that's the difference here. When we understand that God is judge, we have a new reference point. We have a vertical reference point. And so it's no longer about stacking ourselves against other people. I'm more moral than another person or I'm more spiritual than another person. But when we understand that all of us here, one day we'll have to give an account before God. All of us here will be evaluated by God. It also uh, transforms the way that we look at other people. James, the brother of Jesus, puts it like this. In James chapter four, verses 11 and 12, he puts it like this. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against the brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge He who was able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? And so what is James saying here? James is saying the same thing. Jesus alone has the authority to make the final judgment on a person. When it comes to judgment, we are not in the business of judging one another. And so what happens is, When we judge another person, we are actually standing in the place of God. I think that's what James is getting at here, what Jesus will tell us in this command. And that is not our place. God alone is the one who will judge fairly and correctly. We are not called to stand in judgment over others. I think that's simply what Jesus is getting at. Now, it sounds so simple, But again, I think many Christians get this wrong because we can often be overcritical and we can be self-righteous when it comes to especially assessing other people and how they live. There is a direct connection of how we treat others and how we relate to God. Again, if we see God as judge, he is the final judge I think it changes the way that we actually view and treat others. And only by accepting God as your judge can we escape a judgmental outlook when it comes to other people. You see, when we see God being over our life, even if we think that we are better than someone or more spiritual, we realize that we are not the standard. We are not perfection and we all are in need of grace. And so I think that's very important for us to understand. If you feel like you have a critical or judgmental spirit, I think the first place that we need to start is we are not the judge. Jesus and Jesus alone will be judged. He is the reference point when it comes to judging other people. Uh, Just... A very honest confession here as a pastor. Uh, Several years ago, uh, when I was living in Atlanta, I was actually leading a Bible study at the University of Georgia, which is about an hour away from where I lived. And on my way to one of the times I was leading a Bible study, uh, I was pulled over for a speeding ticket. Now, it wasn't just any ordinary speeding ticket, but I was actually going more than 25 miles over the limits. Now, in the state of Georgia, if you go 25 miles over the limits, you actually have to go to court to reduce your fine or not to get points taken off. I know this is a very honest confessions of a pastor. And so in the mail, I got my court dates. I went to court and I was pleading with the judge. I'm really sorry. Uh, Not to justify myself, but it was one of those roads where it went from like, you can go 75 and then all of a sudden it drops down to like 55. And so I was going like 80 
It's also trying to explain to the judge, judge, you know, I didn't know that the speed limit changed at this certain stretch of the road. And uh, believe it or not, this judge showed me mercy. And so no points taken off. He reduced my fine. I played the I'm a pastor card and I was trying to do good and trying to lead a Bible study. But what is my point? I was not the standard of judgment, right? The judge was the standard of judgment. It didn't matter if my penalty was uh, how it stacked up to other defendants in the court, right? If I did worse or if I did better, the reference point for judgment was the judge, And in the same way, that's what Jesus says to us. When we accept God as judge, that he is the reference point when it comes to judging, we escape a judgmental attitude towards other people. And so that's the proper perspective that we need to have. Second, the attitude to have when it comes to judging. I'm going to read these verses again, verses three to five. Why do you see the speck? that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with this verse. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He uses a very comical illustration here. Now, why does he use a picture of the eye? I think a couple of reasons. The eye is the most sensitive areas in the human body. And so when it comes to judging others or confronting others, it's a sensitive issue. I think that's the reason why he uses the body part of the eye. And I think the second reason why is clarity. Obviously, we need eyes to see. And so when we assess the situation, I think Jesus uses this illustration of an eye because we want to avoid disaster. We want to be judgmental towards others, but also we need discernment when it comes to confronting others in community. So a couple of things I want to point out here. When Jesus uses the illustration, I think the first thing that we need to understand, it's a call to self-examination. It's a call to self-examination. Now, again, let's think about the illustration that Jesus uses here. Imagine your friend has a speck of dust in their eye. And I I think many of us have, have experienced this, whether it be like an eyelash or a piece of dirt, right? And your friend says to you, well, let me take that piece of dirt or that eyelash around your eye. But you see or you notice your friend, just imagine with me, has a plank in their eye, a two by four. Now, if you think about this imagery that Jesus is giving here, you can't even get close enough to actually get to that person's eye because you have this two by four sticking out of your own eye. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, how ridiculous is it that you, can, that you think you can help someone remove the speck out of your, their eye when you have a plank coming out of your own eye? See, when you and I try to correct others, we need to first look at ourselves. That's the point that Jesus is making here. And when we don't examine ourselves, the attitude can often lead to superiority or an overestimation of yourself. And so the whole point that Jesus is getting at and giving this very silly illustration is that before we actually confront others, right, in community, we need to take an honest assessment of ourselves. See, in relationships, there are moments when our friends have speck in their eyes and it's a good impulse to help whether it be a sin issue or maybe it's a character flaw that they have. But Jesus will point out to us that first we need to look inward and to have an honest assessment about ourselves before we actually take out specks in other people's eyes. I think all of us have experienced this in community. You have that one person who loves to point out different flaws or loves to criticize And if you're that person, Jesus will say to you, well, you need to first examine your own heart. Look at the areas of blindness in your life. Because here's the truth. All of us here, 
we do not see ourselves accurately, right? We all have blind spots and self-blindness leads us to this inability of refusing to see the way things are, especially about ourselves. I think that's the whole reason why Jesus gives this illustration. We need to take an honest evaluation of ourselves because we are often blinded by the planks in our own eye. My wife was an amateur photographer a long time ago, and she used to take pictures all the, you know, whether it be at weddings or different photo shoots. And uh, there was this one time where she was taking pictures of us while we were dating. And I don't know if you ever have done this, but you start looking at pictures of yourself in different shoots and you just don't like yourself in different, different pictures. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Like you think to yourself, man, do I really look like that? Or I feel like I, I gained a lot of weight in this one picture or, you know, I, I don't like this about myself. And I would ask my wife, you know, do I really look like this? Or is this a bad angle that you took this picture of me? The funny thing is, if you ask my wife, she would say straight up, yeah, this is how you actually look, right? And all of us think to ourselves that we look different than what reality uh, sets us to see ourselves. See, what Jesus again reminds us of when he says to take the plank out of our own eye is to examine yourself. Have a reality check with your own life and with your own heart. We are quick to see the wrongs in others, and yet we are so resistant to acknowledge our own failures. I think that's in summary what Jesus will tell us. You see, love for others starts with acknowledging our own weaknesses and our own faults. You see, real Christian community requires us to look in the mirror and as before we actually love and serve others, we start with our own sins and shortcomings. In fact, I would say that if we do not acknowledge our own shortcomings, we can never be in a position to help others because again, we will come off as critical or judgmental. The question that's often asked when it comes to this passage, well, does that mean unless I totally fix myself, uh, when am I ever ready to help others or to speak into others' lives? Because my life is always messy. It seems like I always have planks in my own eyes. And I would say, well, there's never going to be a time where our life is totally free of planks and, and, and specks. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think what he is saying is that before we deal with others, you and I need to come to a place where we acknowledge our own brokenness and we approach and deal with others with humility. You see, I think as we deal with one another in community, we should see ourselves as needy. We too are also needy of the grace of God. We need the grace and mercy of Jesus. We all need restoration. We all need forgiveness. And when we don't have that insight in mind, what that leads to is that I am better or I am self-righteous. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. We must first acknowledge our own need for grace before we help others. Some questions to ask ourselves when it comes to this area of being judgmental. Number one, are you hypercritical? Are you hypercritical? Some people here are very good at criticizing. And I will say this, we all need criticism. I need criticism because it helps us get better. We all need criticism in our life. I would even go as far to say, Sometimes criticism can be a gift because people point out things that we are not aware of. Again, blind spots that we are not aware of. But some of us, we love to be hypercritical, meaning that we love to point out everything and everyone. We will walk into a room and we just will point out different flaws in different people. Right? We could assess the situation and we could just be critical about that person or the group of people. You see, when we come to that point, we are in danger of being judgmental. Second question, 
Are other sins a bigger deal than yours? This is especially true in marriage. Husbands and wives, we often keep a speck list, right? We look at our spouse and we look at all the, thi- all the sins that we think that are bigger than ours. We can get angrier at the sins of others rather than our own. And what that often leads to is that we see the frequency of other sins rather than ours or other sins a bigger deal than yours. Third, when I confront, are there any ways that I'm guilty of the very thing I'm going to challenge them about? When I deal with others, when I confront others, are there any ways that I'm also guilty of the very same thing that I'm going to challenge them about? What is our motivation when it comes to dealing with other people? Is it for their good or is it to make myself feel better? Again, it is foolish to see that when we don't deal with our own brokenness, that it is foolish to think that we can speak into other people's lives. And that's what Jesus will point out here. Second attitude that we need is that we need the help of others. Okay, what this passage is not saying is that we totally distance ourselves from others. Don't judge me. Don't ever criticize me. What he is saying is that we do need specks and logs removed. That's the whole point of community, right? Specks have to be dealt with. Sin has to be dealt with in Christian community. And so the takeaway is not, well, don't ever speak into my life because you're being judgmental. We need people to come alongside of us and point out different specks in our lives. We need evaluation and we need people to speak truth to us. The apostle Paul will put it like this in Galatians chapter six, verses one through four. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his neighbor. One of the signs of a healthy church is that we learn how to correct and to speak into each other's lives. You see, we need that in Christian community. Not in a condemning condemning way. We don't write people off. We don't just tell people, you know, the way it is or that we want to just win an argument. But what Paul will say here, the motivation of us to restore others, he says it right here, is through, uh, the motivation is through restoration. That's what Paul will say here. This word restore is actually interesting, what Paul uses here. It's actually a medical term to mend a broken bone or dislocated bone. And so what Paul will say here in the language that he uses here, let's say your brother or sister breaks a bone or dislocates a bone, right? It would not be helpful or loving if we left that person alone, right? If someone broke their leg or their arm, to leave them alone is not loving. We need to help them. We need to gently restore them. And in a spiritual context, what that means is there are times where we may need to rebuke or to correct someone, but restoration should be the goal. Not to win an argument, not to think that we are better than them, but it always should be for their good. That's what Paul will say here. When we look at others, it should be with a spirit of humility and empathy acknowledging that I am capable of falling just like you. That's what Galatians is saying here. And so, yes, we are called to restore one another, but it should be with an attitude of gentleness, humility, and empathy for their good. I don't know if you ever heard the name Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was actually a medical doctor who became a pastor later on in his life. 
And he wrote in this particular commentary that the eye is the most sensitive part of the body. And when you take a speck of dust out of someone's eye, he will go on to say, how do you actually do that? And he writes, you need soft and precise touch. In other words, to actually restore a person, you need softness and precision, gentleness, gentleness and compassion. And so what that means is, it means first again, examining ourselves, the humility that comes from self-examination, the humility that recognizes that I am also guilty and also capable of the same things. You see, all of us here, we might not struggle with the same things, but it also means that there are stuff going on in my life that I have issues in my life, just that you have issues in your life as well. We need to remember again, God's goal is always redemption and restoration. It's not proving whether we're right or wrong, but God's goal is redemption and restoration. I will go on further to say, if a brother or sister is in sin, or if there's a character issue, I think what it means to walk in humility is to say, how can I walk with you to overcome this particular issue? It's not just telling that person the way it is, but in a loving way, how can I walk with you to overcome this particular issue? Because again, the goal is always redemption and restoration. Third, the discernment we need for judging. Now, he concludes this segment of the Sermon on the Mount by giving us this very odd illustration. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What in the world is Jesus saying here? Well, I think in summary, what Jesus is saying here is that we need discernment when it comes to judging others. We need discernment when it comes to judging others. He uses this illustration of a pearl. Now, pearl in biblical language or biblical literature, it's either the gospel of the kingdom or another way to put it, it's God's wisdom and truth. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. And so as he gives this illustration, he's saying dogs don't appreciate what is holy. Pigs have no use for pearls. If you throw a pearl at a pig, they will have no use for them. And so his whole point in verse six is don't give precious things to people who don't value it. Don't give precious things to people who won't value it. Again, it's a case for discernment because yes, we need to deal with people. Yes, we need to confront people. But he's also saying that when we do that, we need wise discernment. And the reason why is this, there are some cases and some relationships, no matter what you say to that person, they won't wanna hear it. I'm sure we've had people in our lives that you can identify with. Maybe we're one of those kind of people. We're just at a place where no matter what someone says to us, we just don't wanna hear it. People may be angry, even anti-God, and it's unwise to engage with them. If you think about it, some people who hear the gospel will respond right away. They would acknowledge their sinfulness and how they are lost and they will give up everything to follow him. But there's also certain people who have nothing, who have, do, have not, do, do not want anything to do with the gospel. And so we need discretion when we approach those people. We need to make judgment calls. I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Yes, we need to stand up for what is good, but also have the discernment and the balance to understand when to actually deal with people in a very wise way. This can be very hard and very challenging because again, there are few of us where we love to tell people how it is. We are just natural born truth tellers. And Jesus will say, well, you need to be careful of being judgmental. But there are some of us here who won't ever say anything, right? You will kind of come to this conclusion, well, it's not really a big deal. Or is that really against God? And you will just be very passive. 
And I think what Jesus will say to you is that you need to be a little bit more discerning. There are times where you need to be courageous. And so yes, judge, being judgmental and all these things is what Jesus is simply getting at. But in light of all those things, we need the wisdom of God when to exercise certain things when it comes to dealing with others. So what does this all mean for us? I just wanna give us three takeaways before we close our time and go into communion. Number one, we need a pro- proper judgment starts with being in community. The one thing I want us to notice here when Jesus talks about do not judge, he's talking about it in the context of community, right? He's really indicating that conflicts will come up in community. And when conflicts come up, he's showing us how we deal with those conflicts when it, when it comes to messiness in our lives. I would say the call to discipleship is a call to community. Some of us here will never experience God's restoration. We will never see the blind spots in our life because we're not integrated in community. Again, Matthew chapter seven, verses one through six, Jesus assumes that we are in Christian community and he gives us these instructions of how to deal with one another. Following Jesus is not just private and personal. It's not just you and Jesus. It's not just, you know, going into your room and reading your Bible and praying. That's all important and true. But when we follow Jesus, we follow him together, publicly, communally. We follow Jesus together. Now, I wanna acknowledge that some of us, we've experienced great hurt and difficulty in Christian community. Some of us firsthand have experienced betrayal, maybe even traumatic experiences in community. But I wanna acknowledge that community is always messy. If it's not messy, it's probably not community. We are broken people. And if you think about it, if you gather broken people every single week, it's going to get messy. People are going to have issues. There is going to be imperfection. It's going to be hard. And yet Jesus tells us the call to discipleship is a call to community. And so before we even start to deal with the specks and planks in everyone's eyes, Jesus tells us we need to be involved in community. Second, recognize our own deficits and our consistent need for mercy and grace. I know I've said this enough, but we need to always keep in mind our own shortcomings, our sins, our failures, and our constant need for grace. And I think if we start with that position, then we could start dealing with other people in community. Do we need to remove specks? Absolutely. Does sin need to be confronted? Absolutely. But before we even get to that place, we always need to acknowledge and may we never forget our own need for mercy and grace. And I pray that we would also live in such a way. Judgment really starts with us. How flawed we are, how broken we are, and how much we need Jesus on a daily basis. Third and lastly, look to the one who took our judgment. How was this all possible? We need to look to the one who took our judgment. Who is Jesus? He is the only one who said that we have specks in our own eye, but never had a plank in his eye. He is the only one who was able to show perfect truth and love, grace and justice. Jesus came into the world as a perfect judge who would be judged in our place. You see, Jesus came not to bring judgment, but rather to bear it. That's what happened on the cross. The Lord Jesus is the judge that was judged for us. And on that cross, Jesus took all of our sin, all of our planks and all of our specks. And the only one who never had them bore it on his shoulder to die for us as our substitute so that he could give us a new identity. 
Though we have specks and planks and guilty of sin, we are perfectly loved. Grace and truth embodied in Christ. That is our identity. If your identity is rooted in the cross, again, the fact is that you and I are loved and sinful and broken and glorious. And when we understand that the gospel, we become a community that can lovingly challenge others, but also a lovingly show grace towards others as well. Again, Lloyd-Jones, when he talks about this passage, puts it like this. Once you've seen what Jesus has done for you, it should lead us to humility, to being sympathetic, but it also should lead us to being conscious of our own sin and our own worthiness, that when you see it in another brother or sister, you feel like weeping. And so the starting point always is the gospel. The one who was judged in our place, who took every speck and plank from our life, loves us perfectly. And that's the starting place when it comes to confronting others. It's only then that we are full of sympathy and compassion and that we really want to help others. This is the kind of community we want to be. There are a lot of specks, and I would dare say there are a lot of planks in this room. Life is hard, but what an incredible thing it could be if we can actually help one another in this way with love and kindness. If we could actually say, I know you have certain issues in your life where I know that hurts, but let's walk together in trying to help you and to restore you. And believe it or not, we all need that. I need that. You need that. And we cannot do that unless we first deal with the planks in our own eyes. And so as we look to Jesus, let's go to him and be reminded of his grace and love. It's a call to be with Jesus. And as we do that, Jesus reminds us the community that we are called to be full of love and grace. Let's bow our heads and pray before we go into the communion table.